Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. And can I say Merry Christmas to you? Merry Christmas. We're, we're a week off, but I uh, just am delighted to be able to say that and welcome you here today into worship. How could today get much better? Uh, just thank you so much to our children's choir, to the Thelwells and little Luke. Uh, what a delight. And again, we have uh, the Sorensen family here with us, and they're going to be sharing this afternoon as well. Uh, I am just delighted to be able to spend this time with you and invite you uh, to consider this is our last week of our series, uh, the re-series, Remind Today, Remind. Uh, maybe, how many of you have somebody in your life that's fantastic at reminding does a great job at reminding. There could even be somebody in your family that's so good at it that they remind you when you already remembered. Then there are some of us that would have to admit we could use the occasional reminder. Uh, I know about myself that I can easily forget. I, I can recall back before our phones were capable of being our calendar and appointments, Tom, as well. And I remember as a young youth director, every once in a while I'd be in conversation with somebody and there'd be an important detail, often a request, could you do this with us at this particular date and time? And I, the yes is the answer, but I was immediately worried that I was going to come upon, have you had this, come upon that moment, and I would have forgotten what it was and I would just remember that there was something I should remember. And so on occasion... LaShawn, on occasion, I would call my office and leave a message on my own voicemail because I knew I would be there with my calendar and I didn't want bunches of different slips of paper today, remind. And as we go through this Christmas season, we will calibrate some reminders here in these moments that we kind of conclude our search through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And there's another element to this too. As you know, I really enjoy the fact that these words remind, actually we can think of this a little differently. That our mind may require some recalibrations at times. Not just for us to be remembering something, but that our mind may need to be reshaped. So as we get started, I'm wondering, I think I see maybe there are deacons in the back. I'm not absolutely certain. They, okay, good, good. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll just lay this out there for one last time here as we go through uh, today's service. We have little journals. They're completely blank and, and free for you to decide what you want to put in there. Taking notes, using them for some other purpose is fine. You may already have one, but you forgot one today. Maybe you're a guest and you're thinking, well, I'm only going to be here for today. Well, perfect. Grab one of them. So as our deacons wander through our congregation, you just raise your hand and say, yeah, I'd love one. I'd love one. If you're a child, by the way, these are perfect for you. You can draw in them. You can uh, make a note in them. You could send a message to a friend through it. That's all perfectly fine. A fair game for you. And in fact, what I'm going to do first as we go throughout the congregation and flag down one of our deacons and get one of these for yourself some of us are note takers, some of us are doodlers, that's all just fair game. <clears throat> but I'm going to give you a couple of things to write down almost immediately. First though, turn in your Bibles to Philippians 2. Philippians chapter 2. That's going to be our launching point. <clears throat> but as we do this, some of you are just newly getting those journals. I'm going to give you a couple of journal questions you're going to reflect on later, but you might want to write down now. So here's the first uh, here's the first journal question. Someone I think of as wise is. Someone I think of as wise is. And the second journal question that you can write down for later to reflect on, an area of study I've always wished to grow in is. An area of study I've always wished to grow in is how many of you know more than one language, uh, you can speak more than one language fluently? Anybody? Yeah, I see a couple of hands. I, I have mission trip Spanish. <laughs> Donde es el baño? You know, I can, I can make my way through a few things and I can often understand far more than I can say, but I've always wished. 
I always feel like by the time I'm done with about a two to three week stint in a Spanish-speaking country, if I was just here another month, I'd really start making some ground. But I'd love, Pam, I'd love to be able to be fluent in Spanish. Maybe there's something for you as well. And then these four words for our children, if you would like to keep track, you can write these words down and then you can put hash marks beside them. I'll put them up here and then I'll say them so that you have time to kind of write them down. But the first is either the word remind or the word mind. Remind or mind. Second, Nehemiah. We are in Nehemiah chapter 8 today. Nehemiah, we've been studying our way through, and there's going to be the reappearance of a character that we haven't talked about for a little while, and that's Ezra. And then finally, revival. Revival. All right, so you found your way to Philippians chapter 2, and in verse 5, our minds are discussed. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, taking the form even of a baby in a manger. What greater contrast could there be between where you're coming from and where you've gone to? And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And as we bow our heads to pray, I just want to point something out. As we sing carols, joy to the world, or even some jingle bells, as we decorate with poinsettias and lit trees, never forget it's all about this one thing. Jesus Christ died for you. Oh yeah, we'll scramble under a tree and crack open some gifts, hopefully one person at a time. That would be the culture of my family, very, very stridently, one gift at a time. Might even make you guess first. But as you unwrap paper, whether in that very destructive, balled up way, or somebody here may save the paper for next time. Thank you, Jim. (laughs) As you do, know this. It means nothing outside of the death Jesus died for you considered it all worth it that he would be your sacrifice. Lord God bless us as we dig, as we make our way through this last study of Nehemiah, would you remind us that all of this season, it is about your incredible gift and invitation to salvation. And Lord, If we're honest about it as we come here, it's quite possible that we need you to recalibrate our minds. That our minds may need to be reworked a little bit because it's easy for us to get off your path. So bless us. In the name of Jesus, we ask it and invite you. Amen. And amen. And so you turn to the eighth chapter of Nehemiah. This is our last study in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 8. And some of you recognize Nehemiah goes past chapter 8, and sometimes we finish before the end. And that we're going to do today, so we'll all be okay with that. Nehemiah chapter 8, interestingly, starts before Nehemiah chapter 8. If you in your Bible are looking closely, quite possibly, uh, quite possibly, you will recognize that it actually starts before the first verse of Nehemiah 8. If you're looking closely, you will recognize that the last sentence portion, it's half of a sentence, from the 73rd verse of chapter 7 says this, 
When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. That part is verse 1. So it's verse 73 of chapter 7 on in to verse 1 of chapter 8. When the seventh month comes, the Israelites had settled in their towns. By the way, two chapters ago, in chapter 6, Nehemiah finished the construction of the wall. It was rapid fire work, 52 days, not weeks, 52 days, and they completed the wall. They were booking. And now everybody has gone back to their homes. So this building, rebuilding of the altar, rebuilding of the temple, rebuilding of the walls, the character of God has been restored in their midst, but they are still fairly far off from the pathways of God. And they've gone to their own towns, they're taking care of their own things as the seventh month begins, day one. I've got to tell you that one, one of the reasons that I had been so interested in studying this, uh, this particular passage here in Nehemiah chapter 8, sorry that we've kind of scrolled back a little bit, uh, so, so interested in studying the books of Ezra and Nehemiah is some of what we've been through over the last couple of years. It feels like things that we've started have stopped, things that have been built have crumbled, not just in terms of physical forms, but relationships. And that maybe Nehemiah and Ezra would have something to say to us about rebuilding, about moving forward, about living out the character of God in this community. But as the wall is finished, there's some work left to be done, as we will see from the work of Ezra coming back on the scene. So that you know here, the seventh month is an important month in the Hebrew calendar. For them, it happens to coincide a little bit with our kind of October time period. It's the conclusion of the harvest time. They would use the term ingathering in a different way than some of us oldsters would have. Because it's the time that all the harvest is gathered in. This is, this is the time. You can tell how this year went at this point. And it's done right around the first day of the seventh month. It's all concluded. So in it comes. And there are a few important things that were on their calendar that they had lost track of. I'll show you a little bit about what God had led them to after the exodus from Egypt calling them to practice this thinking that their mind would be shaped <clears throat> and wrapped around a set of festivals and high days so that they could understand better what it was to be a child of God. But they lost track of some of these things. The first is, as you get started in the seventh month, the very first day is the Feast of Trumpets, a 10-day festival where the people would come together. So they're in their own homes... Things have been going just fine. They completed this incredible work, each one working fairly near their own home, but the wall is now built. They're in their homes and need to be reminded that God is up to something big and wants to call them out together. And I wonder if it isn't possible that even as we come back and forth to church, in some way we're still kind of in our own world Maybe it is even possible for you that it feels like it's perfectly fine for you to go it alone. But God seems to have other plans. He calls them out, and they come to this festival time. So for 10 days, there is a feast of trumpets. Trumpets were sounded as a symbolic gesture of judgment, actually. This particular festival was a time to set aside for the inspection. Corporately, you come together, you hear the word of God, and you inspect your own heart and repent. Because on the 10th day of this festival is a special high day. It's the Day of Atonement. Now, what's that all about? Because this notion of a blaring trumpet pronouncing it's, it's time to kind of settle the books. It's judgment time. What's going on here? And then there's the day of atonement. And you might be tempted to think that what this walk with Jesus is all about is to lay claim to eternal life, but he's going to hold you accountable 
to demonstrate why you deserve it, you will be judged. Do you, do you get in or do you not? Part of the Christian world thinks that way. You may have, even when we say otherwise, a part of that rolling through your own heart. But as we have studied in the past, and we'll just quickly bounce through it right now, the Day of Atonement is judging whether the sacrifice of Jesus has a right to save you. The Day of Atonement, all of the sins, the, the, the evidence of the sins that through the, through the whole year had been sacrificed at the altar, this is now placed on a goat figurative of Jesus Christ and he is slain and the question is, is the atonement, is God worthy of saving you? The judgment actually there is that God is proved righteous as he comes in being judged. The whole plan of salvation, does it work? Is it okay? So these first nine days, hearing the word of God, understanding who you are, inspecting your own heart, realizing your need for repentance, but it all still turns to the Lamb of God and his righteousness and that he is worthy. And then finally, there is on the 15th, the Feast of Booths. Now, what's that about? Booths, tabernacles, some would call it the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacles sounds pretty lofty, and that's not what is going on here. What was to happen, which we're going to find evidence that the people, the children of Israel here in Jerusalem now at the time of Nehemiah 8 have lost complete track of this. They don't even realize that this is a thing God has invited them to do. But all the way back when they were in Egypt and brought out of Egypt, God cared for them. He brought them on their exodus. He cared for them in the midst of their desperation. Even when they were questioning, man, maybe we should just go back. And he provides manna and he provides quail and he provides for them. And they're in these temporary hovels, these little tents and huts and so on. So on the Feast of Booze, the 15th, for seven days, the, what the idea, the teaching was, that Moses had taught was, on that week, what you do is you set up a little temporary structure. Everybody comes together, and each family, you set up a little temporary kind of three-walled structure with a little roof on it. You're out in the elements, kind of, but you have your place. It's very temporary, and it speaks to our lives here temporary as they are, but that God, even in the hovel of the messiness of your life, will take care of you and will lead you out of bondage and desperation. Of course, these people, among all people, could have opportunity to really get this because they've been coming out of exile and desperation but they've lost track of some of this teaching. And so we get into the, this, this chapter. So again, when the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. That's the first verse along with the 73rd verse of the previous chapter. When the seventh month came, as they were ready to have the feast of the trumpets, and trumpets blared, and people actually came together. And they came together as one, as one man. I just want to suggest to you, we could, we could, we could spend the whole time right here. That God's people, the, the people of God, we are so unique and different and we have so many issues and things and things that I care about that maybe you don't care about and experiences that I've had that you have not had and vice versa. I want to make a suggestion to you and that is this, that in this world in which we live where we can center primarily on our differences cluster together with same and like groups of people, it is true Christianity that is the one and only thing that can dissolve these differences and make us one. I want to pause here because I, it's been a burden of my heart over the last year and a half because I could feel the fragmentation, the frustration, the tugging and pulling as everything has become politicized and you're this, I'm that. I wear a mask, you do not. 
Vaccination, here's my belief. We have an election, I'm a Republican, I'm a Democrat. We can separate ourselves by black and white and all the world, all the world is interested in separations. And it is only under the blood of Jesus Christ that we can become one. And it is the mission. I, if you think, well, yeah, but they're Hebrews, they're Jews, they're all kind of, they have a thing together. No, no, no. Some, the evidence is, some had forgotten how to read and speak Hebrew. Some had been enslaving their fellow men with usurious loans that would cause them to have to give their sons and daughters in bondage to them. Oh, the separations, the political tearing everything that was going on there, and they come under the trumpet call of God. They come as one. I wonder if indeed it is a part of reminding that we would understand that God has called us not to fight for my thing as much as to give myself away. with the Jesus that would come as a little baby to save you. That is the blood of that God, man, walking this planet for you that allows us to have a new identity and a new mind in him. We could, we could go deeper there. But wow, what an awesome and wonderful thing. And all the people assembled as one man. And we're going to realize that they're talking about men, women, and children here in a minute. But they, they gather not at the temple. They gather at the water gate. So Nehemiah has been working on building this wall. And we talked about the fact that this wall, it's not just about protection. It's about the character of God. And they gather at the character of God. They gather at the wall, the water gate, which is where water flows into the city, bringing life. We know this metaphor, don't we? That life comes with the Spirit. That Jesus would say to a woman who has offered him a drink, oh, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for water. For whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And in ways that we get to understand today that they couldn't have even understood then, as Ezra stands up to preach, the people come to this place that is the symbolic entry of life. As the trumpet, trumpet blasts, as the people gather, here they come. So, verse 2, on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly. And we've talked about it before. Ezra is described as a priest and scribe. In fact, you know, of course, in the New Testament, scribes and Pharisees. Scribes are lumped in with the Pharisees. Pharisees have a pretty bad name. And so this is not seen as a really great thing. You should understand, though, that the Hebrew traditions teach that it is Ezra who actually preserves Scripture, the Old Testament, for us that his hand is at work, guided by God, to make sure that the law and the writings and the prophets are here for you today. Let alone that he wrote, most believe both Ezra and Nehemiah are at that point one work. And he stands up to preach. We're going to get into this in a second, but I want to make this suggestion because we, I, I believe that God is calling us forward out of all the difficulties of today and yesterday calling us forward another great word for it is revival and I want to suggest to you you study it through scripture or through history every revival revival always involves returning to the word of God for some people digging into the word of God feels boring uh, no apology we will always be going to God's word here. 
He stands up to speak, and what does the crowd look like? This crowd was made up of men, women, and all who are able to understand. Who is that? So you got men, and you got women, and then you got all who are able to understand. Who are they? Children. Children. Hebrew custom and culture believe that when you're walking on the path, you should be sharing God's word with your children. When you lie down at night, you should speak the word. When you sit to eat, you should speak the word. And while they ended up having all sorts of divisions of worship, here they are on this high and holy time as they've called everyone together corporately and the preacher stands up and there are men and women and children all together. Children... I am so glad you are here. Young parent, please, please, I know what it is. You can flinch and you can feel apologetic, but never feel a need to apologize for the cries of your infant. We will have always children's ministries, youth ministries, early teen ministries, but we covet that our children are here for corporate worship. And we will tell stories with our back to the adults. And we will sing songs. Oh, praise God. We will sing songs out of the voices of our children. They will teach us much. And we will invite them to learn from God's word with us. And there may be some things they don't understand. Hey, there are things I don't understand. We may never know the exact moment that the most understanding even takes place because we will walk beside one another together. So delighted that we not only invite, just a side of insist, that our corporate worship involve our children. So Ezra... Ezra the scribe stands on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. If you get this sense, all the people have gathered and the, the platform is placed there and Ezra is going to preach the word of God. In fact, check this out. He read it aloud from daybreak until noon. <laughs> and all the people listened attentively to the book of the law, the books of Moses. That's six-ish hours maybe seven, as he speaks the word of God, and they are, they are, cl- they are hooked in. And by the way, I end up in a conversation here or there about whether church matters or not. And I think at its core, one thing we must always understand and admit is you will never be saved by the church. You are not saved by what membership you hold. But I would argue with the supposition that church does not matter and particularly that corporate worship does not matter. For if you follow the footsteps of Jesus, the writings of Paul, the Old Testament teachings that are clearly not simply about what was going on back then, but about how human beings encounter God, you will find with regularity this call to corporate worship. The preaching of the word of God. It matters. It matters. And if by chance, which I love it if you are, if you are watching this from home right now, we are so glad that we have the opportunity to extend the texture of our family across the airwaves, but I wonder if it isn't time for you to come and take your place in corporate worship. You can do part of this alone, but part of it you cannot. Maybe even if you live some other part of the country and you found this to be a part of your home, we recommend you continue to do so, but you must find a local congregation that you can worship in. So, men, women, children, there they all are. Ezra stands to preach the word of God, and while he does so, a bunch of names listed here, about 13 men are also teaching from this platform. I think it's fantastic. I'm not sure even how it would work, whether they took turns or not. 
A little later in the conversation, you will notice that there are 13 Levites that are out among the people because, by the way, it is important, and it's repeatedly mentioned as such, it is important for the people not just to hear the word. It's not some magic incantation, but that they understand. And it seems that this occasion gets it that it's not simply by speaking the words that you will understand. You may need to ask a question. You may need to discuss this together. You may need to unpack, how does this have anything to do with my home, my household, the things I'm up to? It's one of the reasons I'm so anxious for you to consider participating in a small group. Make use of the deeper dive studies that are put together for you every week so that you can unpack the preaching of the word and your community can build and your questions get to be asked. Oh, I hope. I am praying over it. We'll continue on as we go through the course of this new year, asking you, encouraging you to consider becoming a part of a sermon study small group where you get to unpack and dig deeper through our deeper dive lessons. So, at the course of this time, Ezra is speaking. He opens the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, all the people stood up. They could tell, even though they had been disconnected, for some of them, this is the first time they're hearing this. Some of the traditions were no longer being passed down by father to son and mom to daughter and family to family. They lost track. And Ezra stands and The small group leaders go out into the people and help with discussions through the course of time so that they can understand what is being said. And as this festival is intending, it's a time of introspection. It's a time of repentance. It's a time to come to your knees to understand who God is and what he is doing for you. I just want to give you an invitation. Some of you have these journals. Others of you would have your phone. What I want you to do is go to a place. Maybe it's your calendar or in your journal. I want you to write down a date. And I want to make an invitation, a very clear invitation to you. Here's the date. You ready? You ready? No? You're not ready? Okay, well, gear up. Take another minute. Breathe deeply. Here we go. January 5 through 14. January 5 through 14, if you have uh, similar mathematics as I do, that's 10 days. We will be holding in this room 10 days of prayer. January 5 through 14 at 7 o'clock in the evening, I plead with you to reserve some time to come and pray together. 10 days of prayer. 10 days of prayer introspection, giving God the opportunity, saying to him, hey, if there's something about my mind you need to rework, I need to kneel before you and open myself, remind me. Maybe you can't be here for every single day. Lock in some part of it, please. It's going to be a short period of time, about 45 minutes is my understanding, led each evening by one of our pastors and our, but it's about spending time in prayer in groups of two, three. If God, I I just really believe God wants to do something important in 2022 in our family. But if he's going to, we need to seek him in prayer. I encourage you not to simply be a visitor to what God is doing. But to come, kneel, and listen for what he has in mind. So as the people listen to the teachings of Ezra, as they discuss in their small groups, Ezra praises the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and responded. There is a a worship response. This sounds a little extra uh, active for those of us that are Seventh-day Adventists and have trouble with anything above the shoulders. All the people lifted their hands, maybe down in here somewhere. And responded, amen, amen. And then they bowed down low and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. They were moved. This time of introspection, this time of repentance, they were moved in their hearts and in their souls. 
The eighth verse says that they read from the book of the law, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. See, prior to this, they had been fragmented. They had been, they had been discouraged. They had been separated and separate. They were all kind of on their own. And in this on-your-own theology, there is an interesting error that regularly creeps in no matter how you cut it. And that is, when you're on your own, the thing is, am I measuring up? Do I have this thing under control? We can praise the name of Jesus in one moment, speaking of his incredible gift and sacrifice, and in the next moment, turn our hearts to measuring ourselves and whether we merit, whether we stack up, whether we have earned the right to salvation. Error number one out of two that we'll talk about is this notion that you can save yourself. I think this is one of the things that feeds into the idea that I don't need the church. I can do this on my own. You and I are in trouble in this world. I don't know if you, because this is the truth of it, you may lean and find your way to this error and all the while in the midst of it you know you you know it's a fake you know it's a facade you know it's not I don't think it's gonna work so we have this reminder you cannot do this on your own is it possible that somebody stayed at home when the trumpets blew yeah It always seems there's somebody that stays at home. But God is calling you out to the place where you are not the one responsible for your salvation. Error number one is that you can do this. You got it. You're good enough. You can work it out. You're a nice enough person. Well, the people now have been listening to the word of God and the law of Moses and they've been staring into a mirror and they've been noticing the reflection of their own smudged up, dirty faces and they are feeling this compulsion. I realize I was doing this on my own. I'm in trouble here. Nehemiah 8, 9 says, all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law and this is the interesting swing of the pendulum to go one minute from the one error, which is I can do this thing myself, and go flying off to the second error, which is, yeah, now that I look at it, I can't be saved. And Right here among us, surely, there are those who are in the midst of working on their own salvation under this notion that I can save myself. And those who are under the weight of of the clarity of the observation, yeah, I'm never, ever gonna make it. In both cases, with both errors, the focus is on me. And Jesus comes and says, look, let this mind be in you. Jesus. Let your mind be remade. It's starting with Jesus. For while it is true that you cannot save yourself, you cannot do this on your own, the second reminder we need to hear is you don't need to do it on your own. You don't need to do this in your own way. The way has been made. You see, the people who have been functioning on their own come together, hear the word, oh my goodness, they realize how far short they come from the glory of God, and they are compelled, convicted, they realize they are in trouble, and they are weeping, and Nehemiah, who has not spoken up yet, has been off to the side, which by the way, leaders in the church, this is a tremendous and awesome and wonderful, Dennis, message to leaders. Be willing to stand off to the side. Give the platform to Ezra on occasion, especially when it comes to speaking the word. 
But now Nehemiah, who's observed all of this, and he knows what's going on, and he has a discerning mind, and he is a leader, and knows he can make a difference, he steps forward along with Ezra, and he says, look, this day is sacred to the Lord our God, but not for mourning. It is just as wrong to spend your spiritual energy flogging yourself over your inadequacies and focusing on you and your inadequacies as it is focusing on you and your ability to accomplish your own salvation. In both cases, it's just positive or negative, but it's focusing on the wrong thing. And Nehemiah and Ezra, they say, look, this is about the Lord, God, who is your salvation. Nehemiah says, This day is sacred to our God. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. You see, you and I might have looked at that little timeline with the feasts of trumpets blowing the judgment, but the judgment is that Jesus' sacrifice saves you. That you can be saved. That his, on the day of atonement, it actually does exhaust the call for the penalty of sin on your life. This is a day of rejoicing, Nehemiah says, not for weeping. We need to get rid of both errors, that the focus is not on your ability to save yourself or the inability of you to save yourself. The focus is on the little babe born in a manger, grown to a man, sacrificed on a cross for you. Be renewed, be remade, be reminded. who he is and what he has done. And so Philippians says, let this mind be in you. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Recalibrate how you see what it is that's going on here. Yes, it is true. You cannot do this on your own. But you need not do this on your own. Another way to say it is this. You need a Savior. And you have a Savior. As we go through this Christmas season, that's what it's about. That you can face a doctor's message. The loss of a loved one. That we can be one whether our skin tone is the same or whether we're wearing a mask. That there is power in the blood of Jesus. See, Rebuilding the walls, that was a physical thing, but rebuilding, rebuilding. By the renewing of the mind to be the people of God. This is what God, this is what God has been looking for. We won't get very far in it, but just the first verse of this next part of the story tells of what happens on the 15th of that month because they, they had lost track of the Feast of Tabernacles. This notion, they find it. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in booths during the Feast of the seventh month at, at the 15th day. And so they do this. They all come out and they build these temporary structures. It's not even, it wouldn't even be fitting of a big camporee for our pathfinders. It's all a statement that God will provide and God will save and God will carry us through no matter how desperate the hovel of my life looks. And you see the incredible piece of that that they were in testimony and in testament to as they surround these walls and the tabernacle that's inside which is nothing like the temple in heaven. Something like, but nothing like its glory and majesty, is that in fact it's not only true that Jesus calls us to be willing to include him in this theological thinking, but he will say, This Jesus, this word will become flesh and he will make his dwelling with us. That when they in those seven days in our October would be 
under a little hut, braving the weather, knowing this is not some place they actually want to stay. Wow, the metaphors. That they would look across and see a temple they had built, which was a testament to the fact that this Jesus did not think he was too much to come to this place, become a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, and to live among us. In your hovel, in my temporary shelter, he came and dwelt among us. And the Greek word there could most accurately be translated, he came and tabernacled with us. Boothed. He came. In fact, we celebrate this time of year that the virgin who is with child giving birth to a son will call him what? God with us. You may not have really calibrated that you cannot save yourself. It doesn't matter how good you are. You may be struggling under the weight right now of this clarity that you are not good enough. And you're right. But that's not the point. He is. And he's given himself for you. Lord God, bless us. As we sing our Christmas carols and songs as we eat cranberry sauce and special treats as we open gifts and give them away as we sit around twinkling lights may we not be confused but have a mind of Christ be reminded calibrated to you all this all this all this means something because of you means something because you bled and died on a cross for me and so we give ourselves this christmas season to you and today as we close some of you know if you got here as a guest and saw the little sign at the offering thing you might have seen that it says it's gifts for Jesus today and you might go well that I mean I, I, I okay any offering I guess would be a gift for Jesus you might not have realized what it is that we're doing today so let me explain it to you one of the uh, one of our best friends here at the College Dale Church is the Samaritan Center it's a part of our heart we support it, many of you do, with your labor, your love, and belongings, and things, and gifts. Because the Samaritan Center, which, by the way, Tony Dahlberg said to me, please, please make sure that the church knows how thankful we are for your partnership and your graciousness. But today, we're going to collect, some of you have brought them, we're going to collect gifts for Jesus. We have deacons that will come and help you kind of position them, so you come down the aisles and you go to each of these, kind of near each table, and they will position them for you. But I want to show you something that comes yelling out of the book of Nehemiah, for Nehemiah will say, hey, what are you all, what are you all weeping for? This is a time of celebration. And then he says this, so go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks over the Christmas holiday. Don't feel bad about enjoying some good good food but send some to those who have nothing so we do it as Pastor Jim sings right now I'm going to invite you if you have a gift for Jesus this gift to the Samaritan Center to come on up never ever forget God calls us to those who have nothing